So I'm just going to quickly introduce Jim Hanna, who's uh, head of the um, Environment Affairs Department at Starbucks, which has uh, been a wonderful partner with ICCF uh, for many years. And uh, look forward to hearing what Jim has to say. So, Jim. How's that? It's a little quiet. So welcome to everyone in the uh, overflow room. Apologies for being on video only, but uh, that's the way it works. And uh, coming in from sunny Seattle where it's 62 degrees and raining right now, it's interesting times over there. So I would love for you to bring some of that heat back to Seattle if you're ever flying in that region. It's really been a terrible, terrible summer. But what I want to do today really is, um, first of all, thank you, John, and, and your organization for inviting Starbucks to participate in this, in this briefing. And what I want to do is, is try to follow up with Harrison Ford, and that's always difficult to do. I'm glad he wasn't here in person, obviously. But take it from that 50,000-foot level of, of the importance of conservation supply chain really down to the 20,000-foot level of, of coffee. And um, if you're not familiar with Starbucks, anyone? <laughs> Thank you. And you're all patrons, I assume. But um, with Starbucks, the, the, the proposition of ethically sourcing our coffee makes absolute business sense for the company. And I want to talk about some of the business drivers, talk about some of our partnerships with Conservation International, who we've been partnering with, with for almost 20 years now, uh, to help us develop good ethical sourcing programs and conservation sourcing programs for our coffee. Um, and really just open it up for questions and answers after that. But my goal today is, is to, to give you a better understanding of the world of coffee and hope that you can extrapolate that into, into other supply chain materials out there because there are definite parallels between those two industries. And the clicker never works, does it? Is that laptop in the way from the, from the sensor? Hear any good Starbucks jokes lately? <laughs> <laughs> I hear them all the time. It's, we have our shareholders meeting every year, and we, we replay all the crazy video uh, from over the years of, of all the terrible things people said about Starbucks, and it's, it's interesting to, to hear that conversation, especially when Stephen Colbert likes to riff on us. That's fun. Now you're just banging through all my slides there. Thanks. All right, do you want to do it manually? Okay. Next slide's good. So for us, we've been around since 1971 as a company. Uh, started in little old Seattle, Washington, out on the left coast, and Pike Place Market is, is where our original location is. And for us, if you look at the mission statement of our company, it's, it's really to inspire the human spirit. Um, and we, we often s use the cliche, we're not in the coffee business serving people, we're in the people business serving coffee. And even though that sounds a bit cliche, it's, it's a legitimate way we look at our operations as a company. Coffee is really just part of our, the, our culture of a company, but the real meat and bones of our business structure and the real meat and bones of, of what we talk about as, as the business case for Starbucks is this place to have human connection and this place for people to come that's not home, it's not work, it's this third place where you can spend a lot of time you know, having meetings with, with your fellow staffers, um, you know, meeting, meeting people, having first dates. Starbucks is actually the, the number one first date location in the country right now. So, because it's that, it's that short commitment, you know, you don't have to go to dinner, <laughs> you don't have to have a tennis game with them. It's just like, coffee, wow, I hate this person, I'm out of here. And, or it can lead to bigger and better things because of the romance of Starbucks and romance of coffee associated with that. So, next slide, please. <laughs> so, we are a company that is attempting to use our scale for good. And that's a sea change for Starbucks. Um, we have often, you know, we, you mentioned a lot of the other ICCF partners out there, Walmart, ExxonMobil, others out there. Often what you see from large multinationals is we hide behind our size and we downplay the size of our companies. And traditionally, Starbucks has done that same thing. But, you know, probably two or three years ago, we finally said, let's stop hiding behind our size and let's say that we're going to use our size for good. We're going to use our size to be game changers in the industry. And we're going to talk about the size of our company and how that can actually benefit the world and how it can actually change the industry, change uh, the coffee sector when we're talking about Starbucks specifically. So we're not, we're not hiding behind our size anymore. We think size is good in, in many cases. And more and more you're going to see Starbucks communi communicating about our ability to be game changers in the industry because of our size. And uh, it's, it's, a, it's an approach I really like being an environmental affairs team, part of our public affairs team. It gives us a good message to talk about. So uh, stay tuned for that one. Go ahead. So we, we have what we call our responsible business practices. We break them down into three buckets. Uh, ethical sourcing, which I'll talk about today, environmental stewardship. Um, funny we put the cup up there. It's, it's 
uh, when you ask any person on the street, what is Starbucks' greatest environmental impact? And um, honestly, it's our stores. You know, we have 17,000 stores around the world that use a lot of energy, uh, spend a lot of money uh, s s procuring resources. And, and But when you ask the customer on the street, what's the greatest environmental impact of Starbucks? They'll say, it's this damn cup. And I'm done with this cup. I don't know what to do with that. I can't recycle it. I'm going to hold Starbucks responsible for that. So it's, it's interesting the perceptions people have around environmental footprinting, around what really matters in the world when it comes to, um, to being an ethical company or being a responsible company. And one of our jobs really is to change that perception uh, for, for, the, for the better so people can understand <coughs> when they choose to spend their dollar at a business that, and they want that business to be doing good, that they're measuring them by the right metrics. And all across these three sectors, whether it's ethical sourcing, environmental impact, or how we treat our communities and how we, how we show up in our communities, um, all of these things are important for Starbucks to understand and the people to understand that the things we do are actually making a difference. And <coughs> we don't play up the small things, we play up the big things. Um, ironically, uh, the, the second largest environmental footprint we have as a company is our, is our whipped cream, if you can believe that. So. We'll t we can talk about that later, but we'll, we'll move on. Go ahead. <laughs> Don't stop using whipped cream. It's delicious. Um, so I want to talk about our ethical sourcing program today. And our goal is that by 2015, 100% of our coffee is what we call ethically sourced. And uh, on the next slide, we'll get into how we define ethical sourcing. But we've been partnering with Conservation National, like I said, for almost 20 years now to really define in the industry what sustainable sourcing of coffee means, what it means, what all the metrics and the factors are around and all the business cases around defining what sustainable sourcing of coffee means. And, cons and CI, I use CI as a term, but they, um, CI really helped us develop what are called our cafe practices and helped us develop for farmers specifically the practices and the measures that they need to take to meet Starbucks standards and to meet our ethical sourcing, our sustainable sourcing guidelines. And I'll dive into a bit, uh, what those are in a minute. Go ahead, next slide. I apologize you have to squat there the whole lunch. That really stinks. But So for Starbucks, again, we look at a holistic approach to ethical sourcing. On, and this is a, a really small graph, but what it talks about is uh, it talks about providing direct loans to farmers. It talks about our cafe practices verification system. Um, it talks about providing direct support via um, agricultural offices in the communities that grow coffee around the world, uh, which are really Central America, Africa, and, and Indonesia. Um, and it really takes a holistic approach to how we support farmers. But again, uh, John mentioned this early on, and I appreciate that line. Um, conservation sourcing is not philanthropy. Conservation sourcing is treating people in these countries as business people, understanding that, that they have the same business drivers that we do as American companies, and taking advantage of those business drivers to help them not only elevate their business, but really help them elevate the conservation aspect of what they do as a company. Because when we look at some of the things that are happening um, in the ecosystems and the environment around the world, you know, these coffee farmers have a choice on whether or not they want to grow coffee. And we treat them with the respect of business people and not as philanthropy cases. So when we talk about how we verify coffee, when we talk about how we provide microloans to these farmers, when we talk about all these things we do on the ground with coffee farmers, it's really how we, how we elevate the quality of their coffee. It's how we elevate the, the livelihoods of their family. It's how we make sure that, that the, the soil that they're using and the eco-conditions eco that they are p playing part of are going to be around for 10, 20, 30, 50 years down the road. Because when we look at our supply chain, it's, it's coffee. And everything else is really subsidiary to that. And coffee is a very fragile uh, uh, agricultural product for those of you who are in ag school, uh, which I learned from one of my friends, new friends at the table. But coffee is a very uh, fragile agricultural product. And it really requires very specific microclimate conditions. And as we see changes in soil conditions, you know, we see erosion and weather events and all these things that are, that are happening more, more frequently and more often. Um, it's putting these coffee farmers' lives in jeopardy. So what we have to do is make sure that we are sustaining those lives. And we do that through a number of programs that we talked about. Go ahead. So here is what Starbucks considers third-party verified coffee. Again, the Cafe Praxis system on the left is a program we developed with Conservation International. It's a verified uh, program that we use. And essentially what this is, in a nutshell, is about 20 pages of metrics for coffee farmers. It's really, are you growing, are you maintaining shade canopies? Are you using less water? Are you minimizing the amount of pesticides you use on your, on your production? Are you, you know, uh, are you growing using um, other methods? And is there transparency in your supply chain so that we can understand down to the picker level how much those folks are making? Because the exploitation that's happening, you know, we mentioned illegal logging earlier, the exploitation that's happening in this arena um, is something we all have to be vigilant about every day and making sure that those folks who are most vulnerable, those folks who are actually picking the coffee, are not subject to the, um, some of the labor conditions that we see in, in other countries around the world. And again, this isn't philanthropy. It's about if you grow in the shade, you actually produce a better quality coffee. If you can minimize the amount of 
petroleum-based pesticides and fertilizers you have to use on your product, you're reducing your operating costs and you're putting more money in your pocket. If you can minimize the amount of water you have to use, you're providing more clean drinking water for communities. So we look at these approaches and say, it makes absolute business sense for these folks to do it. It increases the quality of our coffee and increases the longevity of the rice. We also talk about some of the other organizations, uh, Fair Trade and Transfer USA, and really other viable certification parties out there. And when we talk about how we want to be 100% fair, 100% certified, we can use any number of those organizations. So this is the most tiny picture I've ever seen. Hmm. So we'll look at our goal around <coughs> ethical sourcing and what this, I would just ask you to go to starbucks.com slash <laughs> whatever's up on that screen. But, but really, um, what this does is, is we quantitatively track our metrics in meeting these goals. And we are a company that believes in transparency to the core. So year after year after year, we're tracking how close we're getting to these, these quantitative goals that we have as, a, have as a company. And year after year after year, we're telling our customers and telling our stakeholders and telling our consumers where we're, where we're headed. Uh, with ethical, ethical sourcing, we're, we're well on track to meeting that 100% goal by 2015. And again, you know, I, I roll back to the issue um, of business case. When our customers decide whether or not they want to come to Starbucks <coughs> and customers more and more these days and citizens more and more these days are making decisions with their dollars based on their values. If we are a company that parallels and shares those values, we're going to get and maintain those customers. And if we're not, they're going to go walk down the street to another company. Um, and coffee is very, very competitive these days. I'm glad you're all Starbucks customers, but not everyone else is. So um, yeah, anyway, um, <coughs> we need to maintain that those kids coming out of college today, graduating college, who are often buying with their with their their conscience, that they become lifetime Starbucks customers. And when they see programs like we're doing around ethical sourcing, um, that helps us become a lifetime partner of Starbucks. Helps them become lifetime customers uh, for us. Go ahead. So farmer loans. Um, this is a great program not only for Starbucks because it provides a return on our investment, but it also is a great program for coffee farmers. So <coughs> imagine if you could that you got one paycheck per year. Hmm, that would be a tough one, because I could not s survive on that. But think about coffee farmers when they do their harvest. They harvest their beans. A lot of times they're throwing a 100 kilogram sack over their shoulder. They're taking it down the hill or down the mountain from, from their farms. Um, and they're going to a co-op or a buyer and, and selling their product at that time. If yields were low that year, if prices are down that year, if they're subject to the commodities price market, um, a number of different factors really impact whether or not that one paycheck per year for them is going to sustain them and their families. And what we do with our farmer loans program is we provide sort of that stopgap for those farmers when times are tough, when years are tough, so they can maintain their livelihoods and maintain their families throughout the year. Because um, I know I couldn't survive on one paycheck a year, and there's no way I could budget those things. And especially as coffee goes like this year after year after year, the, the ability of that farmer to maintain his livelihood and maintain, maintain his livelihood and his family um, are often at risk. So farmer loans really provide and give them a cushion but it also provides a return on our investment for Starbucks. We do get a return on that money, um, um, and it's, it's a good return because those farmers pay back those loans. And again, it keeps them in coffee. It keeps them producing coffee. It keeps them increasing the high quality of that coffee, and they're not switching to some cash crop like pineapples and debilitating the supply of coffee beans for companies like Starbucks. So it makes business sense for us. And really, this is what it's all about. For those of you who can't see that slide, it says Save Our Planet, it's the only one with coffee. And as a, <laughs> as a company that believes um, that we want to be around 50, 60, 100 years into the future, we just celebrated our 40th anniversary, um, we believe that sustainable supply chain and sustainable sourcing and the work that Conservation International and ICCF are doing, um, this is the type of work that needs to be done, both from a policy perspective, from a business practices perspective, and also from an understanding perspective that, as you heard from Harrison Ford saying much more eloquently than I can, it makes absolute business sense for companies to engage in conservation practices. It makes absolute business sense for us as multinational corporations to understand the impacts of non-sustainable production and really try to mitigate those impacts so that we can create that longevity for our companies into the future. So they told me I only had 10 minutes, and I'm going to stop talking right now, and we'll take Q&A at the end uh, after one more speaker. But thank you for your time. Okay, we've got one more speaker, and uh, Brennan's going to come up here. Uh, Brennan uh, Van Dyke is with the Global Environment Facility. Uh, many of you might not know the Global Environment Facility, but they are the world's largest financier of international conservation projects. So we're very lucky to have uh, Brennan here today. Um, I think her official title is Special Advisor to the CEO, but I think she kind of runs the place. Um, anyway, uh, Brennan, um, why don't you come up here and uh, let's do this.
much. Uh, and thank you to ICCF for putting this together and all of the work that you guys do. And uh, as you now know, I'm Brennan Van Dyke with the Global Environment Facility, also known as the GEF. And uh, it is another piece of the effort to bring uh, good quality, well-priced, and environmentally sustainable coffee and other products to you and your family. Um, Starbucks explained to you that they need suppliers that provide or guarantee to provide coffee that has been sustainably produced. And among the many things that Jeff does, it's part of that building of that supply chain. For example, the Jeff has helped farmers through projects to implement a wide range of better production practices that are defined by the sustainable agricultural network. And they uh, have a range of environmental benefits, including uh, biodiversity conservation on the coffee farms themselves, reforestation, often with uh, native plants, water purification, waste treatment, uh, reduction and elimination of agrochemicals, and there are also, at the same time, social benefits that are woven into the sustainable production process, improved living conditions, better sanitary conditions, better uh, labor conditions, better living quarters, the elimination of child labor, which is incredibly important, um, as well as better economic benefits for the farmers. There's uh, more, um, a better price for the coffee and a greater shirt of a good price for the coffee for the farmers. So these, these kinds of efforts and these ki the building of these kinds of supply chains um, provide enormous benefits to not only the farmers, but also, as we saw from the film that was presented by CI, to the world. Uh, better livelihoods means more economic stability. More economic stability means more political stability throughout the world. Um, just a little bit about the GEF itself, because I don't think that many of you probably know what the Global Environment Facility is. It is a partnership of 182 countries. So we are a, a, a governmental, intergovernmental organization that works with the private sector, with civil society, uh, and with international agencies to finance international conservation efforts worldwide. Um, we, our programs uh, enhance the economic and national security interests of the United States by reducing the instability that arises from conflicts over scarce resources, as has been explained to you earlier today. And um, the U.S. Is, is the number one contributor to the Global Environment Facility. It's not the only contributor to the Global Environment Facility, and that's part of the beauty of how we operate, because every U.S. dollar provided to the Global Environment Facility is leveraged 32 times because other countries provide to the facility and then our projects are co-financed by revenues from other sources. So um, the U.S. is out there, I mean, the Jeff is out there working in U.S. interests on conservation worldwide and we bring more money to the table for uh, implementation of those interests across the globe. Um, I was told I really should keep this very, very brief, so I will hopefully have provided you with a good overview of the Global Environment Facility and how we work on supply chain efforts, and if you have any questions, I'm happy to respond to them during question and answer or privately. And thanks again for the opportunity to speak to you. Thank you, Thank you Brennan. Um, We'll have a question and answer uh, period now. We've got a roving microphone, uh, so uh, we can actually uh, hear the questions and uh, if the speakers like to come up here and have the answers. Usually they get out, it starts off slowly, but then people want to talk for 30 minutes. Uh, we will uh, end um, at, uh, um, in about eight minutes, um, and then if people want to have conversations or questions after the that, they can just stay along, but give people the opportunity to get back to their work if they need to. So any of the first questions? Um, here, or in the, yes, James, if you would state your, n your name in the office you're from, makes it a little bit easier to understand the context. Um, hi, my name is Whitney Schneidman, and I head up a consulting firm that works with American companies investing in Africa, and I wanted to ask about Starbucks loans because I think that's a very critical component of what you're doing, making capital available. And actually drill down on, ask you how that works in a, com a country like Ethiopia or Rwanda, 
you know, are you competitive with interest rates? Have you set up a non-bank financial institution? How does that really come to practice? Thanks. We actually provide we actually provide capital to third-party ventures who are providing those those funds. So Starbucks doesn't do any direct lending to to countries and coffee farmers. Um, that all goes through a, through third parties, and we have multiple partners uh, in different regions of the of the world who do that. Um, and you know, it's, as you probably know, as as a consultant in the industry, um, providing those finances to farmers is is either easier or more difficult in different countries, depending on the the robustness of the infrastructure on, around coffee growing or any other agricultural product. Um, but it's it really you know we're not experts in micro lending, so what we really to provide to do and commit to do is provide that capital for those experts who are on the ground in country um, to provide those direct direct loans to to those farmers. Um, you don't see and those lend those loans are spread out either directly to farmers to co-ops and to other other larger bodies. Um, you know m a lot of coffee production around the world is is organized into co-ops because the the average coffee farmer say in Central America. Uh, really has probably five hectares or less of, of coffee production, and their ability to sell directly to a company like Starbucks or other other large producers um, is often difficult. And also, if you look at, if you're familiar with coffee, what's called the commodities market, um, coffee, like any other commodity, oil or anything else, the the price of coffee fluctuates daily. And at the time the cof the farmer goes to sell his product, if he's subject to that commodity market, and that C market we call it. Um, he can be making anywhere between 50 cents to a buck 50 a pound uh, in current fluctuations. So what we try to do is, is work directly with the places that those farmers are selling their beans to also provide that infrastructure to, to provide those market loans. Um, and it's every farmer has different needs, and um, we don't have the staff or the manpower, again, the expertise to actually identify what those different, those different needs are, and we, we leave that up to the co-ops and we leave that up to those third parties. Hi, I'm Nilmini Rubin of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. And so um, Starbucks is the king of coffee. Who's the queen? Um, <laughs> what other companies in, in your space are competing on this conservation ethical front? And what more does Starbucks need to do to kind of maintain the lead? So we didn't, we didn't self-anoint ourselves as king of coffee. That was John who did that. But <laughs> I liked it. We, we try to be a humble company. Um, Funny that one of the running jokes of Starbucks, uh, that our headquarters in Seattle is where the uh, the Death Death Star run by Care Bears were such nice people. So, <laughs> if any of you got that, you're, you're you're old because those are a 70s and an 80 pop 80s pop culture reference. So, phew, wow. Anyway, back to the real question. Um, so we are the largest um, producer or the largest purveyor of specialty arabica coffee beans in the world. Um, we are the largest buyer of that, but. We actually only procure about 1% of the global coffee market, um, which people find shocking. I mean, it, it's, we're, we're a huge company, but, but coffee is a massive industry with 25 million people around the world employed in, in coffee production and, and all throughout the supply chain of coffee. So um, despite John's anointment, I wouldn't necessarily call us kings, but I go back to my previous slide talking about how we can use our size for good. People assume that Starbucks uh, is, is often bigger than it is, and we also have great brand uh, awareness and brand acuity around the world to help drive those industry changes. So our goal with programs like Cafe Practices, um, with our micro lending programs, with how we promote sustainable coffee production is that those become the industry standards and those become the ways that, that coffee is procured. And it's, it's an interesting balance because our competitors don't often always want to say, oh, we borrowed this from Starbucks, but when we developed this, the Cafe Praxis program with Conservation International, we purposely did not trademark, patent, or, or put any protections on that program, and we make that program readily available to any coffee producer out there who wants to utilize that program. Because again, it's, you know, it's, it makes business sense to reduce your, your usage of all these chemicals and reduce your usage of, of costs that go into your system, and at the same time, it produces a higher quality coffee around the world so that there's just more of that coffee on the market for all of us. So I don't know who the queen of coffee would be. I mean, there are much, much larger buyers of coffee out there than Starbucks, um, whether it be Nestle or other, other large commodities buyers who are you know, producing coffee for, for what we call CPG or consumer goods products that go on your grocery shelves. Um, you know, they're producing and, and procuring thousands of times more coffee than Starbucks is. But the specialty coffee industry really drives industry change, and we have the leaders in the special co specialty coffee industry, and we share transparently and openly with the other producers um, everything they want to know about sustainable c production. 
I also mentioned the agronomy offices that we have um, they're in Costa Rica and in Africa. And those agronomy offices provide free agronomist services to any coffee farmer, whether they're a supplier of Starbucks or not, um, to help them understand how to grow higher quality coffee. So we are often serving um, coffee farmers who have never sold to Starbucks um, and have been uh, suppliers for our, other for our competitors for a number of years. But again, if we can raise all boats in this in this initiative and raise all boats and make sure that uh, everyone is, is producing coffee in a way that we think is sustainable, that supply chain will maintain itself uh, over the decades. Please. One of the reasons we taught, we use the term king of coffee and I think is really the idea that when Starbucks talks or does something, people listen. It's something that's involved as a brand in every one of our lives in some way or another. If we don't go there ourselves and our friends or our family do, um, and so in that sense, uh, we try to, um, I think it's important to bring uh, iconic, uh, you know, brands up here to talk about, you know, and obviously Starbucks has got such an incredible uh, head start on most, most others uh, on uh, uh, the importance of conservation and stuff. Uh, but at the same time, I think it was also really good marketing, not that I'm trying to get a job at Starbucks. Um, do we have any other questions? Okay. I think one in the back. Yeah, my name is Kelsey. I'm from Vancouver, Saskatoon, and Bowen County. And I was wondering, you talked about um, trying to have a very clean and um, transparent supply chain. I'm wondering if you can give me a percentage of increase in farmers' livelihoods as a result of Starbucks' influence. That's hard to quantify. You know, uh, and one of the things, one of the great projects that we're working on right now is is looking back on the impacts of cafe practices. And you know we've had this program in place for over a decade now, and the question that comes up is exactly yours. What has the actual impact been um, from cafe practices? So if Bambi's in the room, wherever she's at, Bambi from Conservation International is, is really leading a team to help us. Oh, she's at your table. She's really leading a team to help us look back and quantify the impacts of sustainable coffee production on these farmers' lives, um, not only on the natural environment and on the natural resources, but actually on the livelihoods of, of those farmers. Um, so my answer to that is stay tuned. Um, Bambi's been working really hard on this project for over a year now, and, and we believe, again, that, that quantifying impacts is, is just as important as actually trying to have those impacts. Um, and, and frankly, you know, as John mentioned, um, around our presence and our, and our brand, no other companies ever actually looked back and said, let's make sure that we're actually having an impact on these lives and not just paying lip service um, to, to the marketing folks. So Bambi, I'm putting you on the spot and stay tuned when she's done with her study, we'll let you know. But it's, it's anecdotally, we believe obviously that we're having impacts, um, um, but once we can quantify those, there are, there are a number of other benefits associated with being able to do that. Thank you all. I promise you guys we'll be out here by 115. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you.